Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for this program, which is being brought to us by PRSA's College of Fellows. I'm really pleased to welcome Dean Krukeberg, who will be presenting to us virtually. Dean is a professor in the Department of Communication Studies at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. He's very well known in the field. We're really honored to be hosting this program on his behalf. He is the co-author of three books, Public Relations and Community, A Reconstructed Theory, This is PR, and Transparency, Public Relations, and the Mass Media. Professor Kruckerberg has been presented quite a slew of uh, awards over his life lifetime. He won the NCA, NCA Lifetime Achievement Award for contributions in public relations education, the PRSA Atlas Award for Lifetime Achievement in International Public Relations, and he was also named uh, PRSA's National Outstanding Educator. He has also won the Jackson, Jackson, and Wagner Behavioral Science Research Prize, which is quite prestigious, and the Institute for Public Relations Pathfinder Award. He served as a co-chair of the Commission on Public Relations Education, which is a group that brings together educators and practitioners to make sure that curricula are providing the content that is needed in the profession. And he did that for 15 years. And all that was just a warm up, because last year, he was given the Gold Anvil Award, which is PRSA's highest individual honor. Every year, the Gold Anvil honoree presents a special address, and that's what this is. And the College of Fellows is going to take the recording from this event and offer it to PRSA chapters, sections, districts, and other entities across the country. So thanks to everybody in our studio audience here at the Newhouse School for joining us. I'd like to thank Keith Koblen uh, from SU News Service and an adjunct professor in broadcast journalism for videotaping these proceedings and helping us out with uh, post-production. So the agenda today, and I'm going to move here behind the monitor, is first of all, Dean is going to give a presentation, an overview, if you will, of about 20 minutes on his work in artificial intelligence. I will then initiate some questions with him about the implications of his findings about AI. And then most importantly, we would like our students to ask questions about the implications of what you have just heard. So without further ado, let me present Dr. Krukeberg. Take it away, Dean. Thank you so much. I'm just delighted to uh, uh, be there virtually and uh, looking forward to our discussion. I think the real value of this uh, program will be our Q&A and discussion uh, afterward. But I want to talk about um, uh, artificial intelligence in today's world and uh, its implications, particularly its uh, ethical implications. I note here that there are unprecedented challenges to global society. They're occurring rapidly and unpredictably, um, including uncertainty, social, political, economic, cultural sustainability in a world that is experiencing immense changes within an incredibly compressed uh, time frame. And I just jotted down, I told my class yesterday, my PR ethics class, I said, hey, you know, I grew up, I was in the single digit age in the 50s and the teens and the 60s and the 70s. I said, you know, I thought that's just, you know, there's social unrest, uh, uh, warfare, assassination. He was like, okay, nothing can be more chaotic or unpredictable, Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, you, you name it. And I said, that's nothing. You guys are living through, and I'm here too, of course, but living through things far, far more complex than I've at least ever seen in my time. But um, the idea of sustainability, and I'll just mention what we are all aware of here. Um, um, well, um, the um, um, issues that are going on in the world, everything from, uh, uh, of course, Ukraine, uh, uh, floods in um, Pakistan, and uh, uh, any number of, of uh, questions of uh, politics uh, in Europe, uh, elsewhere. And what's happening here is, again, in a very compressed period of time, and there are changes that uh, really uh, draw into, um, um, into the stakes, the sustainability of, of what we have. And I'll explain that on more later. Okay, Tony, next slide, if you will. Um, 
rapidly evolving communication technology is the primary intervening variable that's creating or directly influencing what can appear to be chaotic, as I just mentioned, unpredictable societal changes that are inadequately understood, let alone sufficiently pondered. And I guess that's my message today is that we have to start pondering uh, with a little more intensity, a little more attention, some of the things that are going on in the world, particularly with communication technology. And I'm not saying they're bad or good. I'm just saying they're there. We have to recognize and fully appreciate what they are. Okay, Tony. See, we got this sophisticated means of transition here. I didn't want to run the slides myself, so I asked Tony. Uh, the, the point to be made and appreciate it is regress to a pastoral and isolationist existence can be likened to a Canutian attempt to hold back the tides. Remember, uh, King Canute actually is trying to illustrate that he was powerless against the tides. And uh, sort of a cataclysmic upheaval of immense uh, proportions, there can be no return to a pre-global, pre-technological society. This will always be with us. Just like I was thinking now, um, uh, of course, uh, nuclear weaponry and then the Cuban Missile Crisis in 62. And now we're concerned once again, the thought of um, nuclear, uh, of course, I was uh, here in other um, uh, parts of the world. But uh, once again, uh, these things can't be put away. We can't undiscover things. We can't undevelop things here. Uh, and for the most part, certainly with communication technology, there's no desire by most people, readily embrace the advantages and convenience of contemporary communication technology. Separate someone from a smartphone for a couple of hours and see what happens to that person. Uh, we are uh, linked into this, we're dependent on it, and furthermore, we like it. So it isn't, it's uh, something that um, uh, we're, we're not going to relinquish. But the message here is that we're sitting in uncharted waters. Draw for little forgiveness for navigational errors, digital or otherwise, but suggest the possibility not the likelihood of unintended consequences for society, both locally and globally. Hey, Tony. Uh, communication technology is changing us in at least four dimensions. Socially, in which electronic channels of communication are replacing face-to-face -face communication. Walk anywhere, and I, I do it on campus on a regular basis, and uh, find anybody who isn't looking down on a smartphone, uh, who's walking. Uh, there are uh, people sitting next to each other, obviously have some relationship with a spouse or whatever. They're both on their, sp on their smartphones, maybe they're talking to one another, but um, uh, these electronic channels of communication are replacing and have for some time now replaced face-to-face -face communication. Politically, power differentials are being flattened and sometimes juxtaposed with unpredictable power emanating quickly from unrecognized and unseen sources. And uh, again, this isn't to be judgmental of this, but it's, it is in fact just taken away like uh, Iran right now, I guess they're you know, trying to shut down the internet in Egypt. Uh, they had, uh, uh, I guess were reasonably successful and it kind of backfired on them because people, um, when they went outside from their bedrooms, uh, while they were tweeting, they realized their power. Uh, but there's examples like this where the certainty and the power, whether it's political, uh, in this context or whatever, it's far more vulnerable. Uh, the power differentials are being flattened there. And again, I think you can think of ample examples of that. Economically, in which information may appear inexpensive to need, to send and to receive results in a greed for this information that ironically, can enslave consumers both financially and through inordinate demands in their time. Uh, and it's this whole another separate set of needs. Uh, I've uh, had uh, people, I remember uh, one uh, television interview where somebody was saying how, you know, things are pretty hard financially. Had a, used to be like, oh, I got to make my car payment or make my rent. And I got to pay my phone bill. And, uh, and I think that kind of exemplifies the importance and the centrality of communication technology in our lives. Or uh, I was telling my class yesterday, uh, we, you, they as students could not survive without the smartphones. They could not function in the university. That's a whole other set of uh, needs um, that um, when I was in college, that you know wasn't wasn't something I didn't have to worry about a phone bill. I, I worry about having a phone. I, I never thought I'd see the day where phones and the status symbol, the type of phone you had, would be a status wouldn't be a status symbol for people as it is today. Culturally, in which global culture is emerging, certainly in consumer tastes for products and services, but to an extent, 
in a melding of traditions and values and a melding that occurs simply because people see things done elsewhere in the world say well that might come for us or so forth but uh, i don't think there'll ever be a global um, society uh, in, in complete where we there's complete um, uh, melding of these traditions and values but certainly uh, the opportunity exists there and the uh, encouragement exists for uh, something like that to happen it's certainly possible okay next time or next slide Particular significance, the question of power, and this is kind of where we get into our discussion today, especially that so it's manifested through the control of information, who controls it, the opacity, that's the lack of transparency, where is it coming from, from whom, is it real, uh, what are their motives, and the dissemination of information, whether this power is social, political, economic, or cultural. Now, that means that um, I remember when I was doing my doctoral work, uh, we were very much concerned in the 70s because of um, uh, large newspaper chains buying out local newspapers. I say, oh my gosh, this newspaper family publisher, they were in this town for three generations, and now they're being bought out by this big conglomerate elsewhere. And, uh, you know, reporters come in, do a little bit of time before they're promoted to a larger circulation newspaper. And this got tremendous um, uh, this power, the advertising dollars going outside town and so forth. And I, I didn't see the argument there. I won't build it on and expand it anymore. Uh, but today, we, of course, as consumers, we provide our own content. Uh, but uh, there's tremendous power that, by and large, we don't recognize or fully appreciate. There's people out there or organizations out there that have control over this. And, um, uh, you know, it might be okay is this significant well it can be significant uh again uh, social political economic culture okay these challenges are presenting themselves during an era that develop croatian scholar now deceased identifies as the third globalization in world history a corporate 21st century which was preceded by the second globalization of the colonial 19th century and the first globalization of the imperial 16th century to put today, power exists everywhere, and here I'm talking about power in all these uh, four dimensions, yet it exists nowhere. Okay, next one. Perceived citizen empowerment may be at least in part illusory. And we can say, okay, we can organize, uh, and you see evidence of this in various countries, like we can organize, uh, whether it's the Arab uh, 1911 um, uh, uh, disruption when the uh, Tunisian, the Tunis uh, vendor started a protest uh, outside a police station and ended up into the Arab Spring or uh, any number of things um, more recent than that. Uh, and citizens collectively and individually with their smartphones, with their um, digital communication have what's obvious power. But um, we also are um, completely dependent consumers uh, of something that we, at least uh, most people, neither fully understand or are controlled by them. And it's withdrawal and or failure would result in mass helplessness because of the social, political, economic, and cultural infrastructure that's been built around this communication technology. I know Charlotte was one city where uh, they, uh, and uh, some of the healthcare institutions here, where there was um, uh, their um, um, databases were being held hostage. Uh, and uh, they, uh, the university here, we, we lost our internet. We weren't being held hostage to anyone, but, um, but we're completely dependent on this where uh, we really can not function uh, adequately uh, with this. I also remember uh, in Eastern Siberia, a very bright young lady, um, uh, she uh, was listening to discussions and she said, what would happen if we pulled the plug? And it's a little more profound than I'm expressing it here. But the point is, is that we are so dependent on the, the grid, the infrastructure, so forth, that we really cannot function meaningfully. Like the East Coast, uh, uh, some of you can relate to that, where um, the um, there was a gasoline shortage simply because of uh, infrastructure had uh, broken down or so forth uh, with computers. Nothing to do with the gasoline availability. It had to do with computers. One indicator of a revolution, that's a term that has to be used very carefully. And I'm not just talking about um, political revolutions here, but uh, generally a new toothpaste isn't a revolution, isn't revolutionary, and it's not a revolution. But uh, revolution occurs when uh, an individual's uh, inability to ignore it, when you can't function uh, without this. I remember um, you know, a few years ago, 
on the new evening news, it was supposed to be kind of um, a cold evening and there's also a homeless population. They said, well, if you need housing, uh, go to this website. Are well, you thinking, okay, this guy's homeless. Does he have a smartphone? He may very well have. It might be uh, you know, a priority where they try to make it. But when you're so linked in that you cannot function without it, that's when you know a revolution has occurred. Okay, the next one. Uh, communication technology has become a major driving force of increasingly linked global society because the do uh, digital media are compressing time and space. And I was telling before our uh, recorded session here, I met with my colleagues and my colleagues here, are, uh, Dr. Mina Wojnovic, she's uh, Croatian, but she's at Monmouth University. And then uh, Chris Galway at Massey University in New Zealand and Craig, uh, Luke, and I still have trouble with his name. He's uh, uh, Polish, but he lives in Australia, University of New South Wales. Um, uh, but we've been working a couple of years now uh, studying these uh, phenomena. And I was uh, sending them an attachment, a Marine up in New Jersey got it right away. And I think they almost had to wait for a minute before it to reach uh, Australia and, um, and New Zealand. So it wasn't quite instantaneous, but still rather remarkable. But uh, time and space are compressed, uh, increasingly inexpensive to communicate. It costs no more to communicate to New Zealand than it does to send an email to, um, um, you know, people up in Syracuse or so forth. So there's obviously uh, previously unimaginable opportunities for global networking. Okay, concern, however, and this we're all aware of, is increased opportunities for criminality and anarchy, as well as increased opacity under the guise of ostensibly increasing transparency. You say, oh, isn't it, everything's transparent now? Well, it is and it isn't. No. Um, uh, first of all, um, you can people and continually warned uh, and a victim of, of scams that didn't originate in our country. They originated in another continent somewhere. Uh, but um, uh, the idea of uh, transparency, what presumably is a, a transparent, that's what really is fundamental to a discussion today about artificial intelligence, which communication technology is on a, enabled on a scale that could have never existed before today's communication technology. And again, what constitutes criminality and anarchy and what should become transparent, what should remain opaque is open to definition and cultural interpretation. Again, this is fundamental to any discussion of, um, of artificial intelligence. Okay, next one. Our research teams have been exploring innovations and adoptions in artificial intelligence, of course, known uh, as AI, whose rapid acceleration has raised critical ethical questions. And that's really what the discussion here is today for public relations practitioners both in their organizational roles and in their professional performance, how they do their job, what their role is in their organization, their professional role in particular, and their, and their performance themselves. Uh, these are occurring so quickly that scholarly examination or ethical ramifications have been insufficient. We really, and there's a lot more there, a uh, lot more attention than me, uh, many people may realize. I'm actually uh, very pleasantly surprised, even like in PRSA with our tech section and our BEPS and so forth, that uh, there is attention being paid for the, to this as it well, it well should. And a lot of different disciplines, professional areas are paying attention to it. And uh, certainly the ethics are, uh, it is being examined, but nevertheless is insufficient. And the fact that it's so rapidly evolving in an unpredictable ways uh, means that it's really hard to catch up, if you will, and to um, be adequate in, your, in our examination of ethics here. The public relations, they don't have an adequate decision-making tools and methods to ethically practice in today's communicative environment. And I would say that is probably fundamental. Uh, some organization, Chartered Institute of Public Relations in the UK, they're uh, 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 very, uh, some very good reports. Uh, Edelman, um, Bushman Hillard, MSL, um, um, and so, well, some other agencies are doing uh, a lot of work. Edelman, in many respects, has been, I think, arguably doing the most work and the most uh, thoughtful introspection about this. But uh, the thing is, is that this is moving so quickly and it's, kind of, I want to say, sneaked up on us. We knew it was there, but it is moving so quickly that really the decision making tools and methods to practice PR and to guide our organizations really are insufficient at this time. That's what I hope the discussion goes to today. Okay, next one, Tony. Artificial intelligence, what is it? My uh, urging here, admonishment, is to keep a very broad and somewhat imprecise definition of artificial intelligence. 
um, Zerfus, um, I, I mean, um, uh, yeah, Dresden, Leipzig, excuse me, uh, University of Leipzig and his colleagues, Tim, some of the others described AI as, and it sounds like a, it's a, a really quite good definition, but um, uh, it's a little bit hard to ponder flexible decision-making processes and actions as software-driven agents. Okay, I get that. They adopt to changing goals in unpredictable situations. That's very important. They can react and uh, react suitably and intelligently to different situations. Learn from experience, again, very important. Aim for rationality, but also carry on in spite of perceptual computational limitations. AI is based on technologies like natural language processing, data retrieval, and knowledge representation, semantic reasoning, machine learning. These authors, and there's again, there's a great many other authors. These people are in our own field here, but um, uh, there's a fair, well, actually a great amount of scholarship being done on this. These authors note the term can be tracked back to the mid-1950s. U.S. computer scientist John McCarthy uh, had a, a, a conference in uh, Dartmouth uh, University. He was from California, actually, but used the label on the grant application. But now, after a half century of him using, the, uh, it was 1956, as I recall, um, a lot, there's been a lot of definitions. Again, my recommendation, certainly in our discussion today, is to consider it to, uh, broadly and don't be too concerned about the precise definition of AI. Okay, next one, Tony. AI is here, and that's something that I'm not sure most people adequately, yeah, I, I'm reasonably certain without sufficient evidence that most people really aren't aware of the extent that AI exists in today's um, uh, communication environment. The transforming organizational landscapes, very true. Today's practice of PR, uh, again, uh, more so than people may realize. Some people, some practitioners very much on top of this, but others like, well, okay, I kind of know it's out there, but I'm not really using it, et cetera. Uh, in your organizations, you might be surprised how they're using. New forms of computation can construct statistical models. Okay, that's easy to understand from large collection of data, or big data, it's been on the agenda for years and discussion, how the system should respond to new data. A chat box, or chat bot rather, can operate more or less on its own. And uh, we've got one article, my colleagues and I, you know, about are you talking to a real uh, title, something like, are you talking to a real person or a chat bot? Might not be even talking to a real person. And that brings up an interesting point about, uh, well, certainly moral agency and uh, your relationship with something that is not, um, it's um, not uh, organic or biological, I guess might be a better way to describe it. More or less on its own using a process known as natural language. Um, language processing. Edelman, again, Edelman's doing a lot of good work here. Um, in a report in 2019, March, observes reports of dramatic improvements in medical diagnostics through AI, as well as improvements, agriculture, earthquake predictions, endangered wildlife protection, and many more applications. Thing is, AI is being used, and many of its uh, uh, outcomes are, are highly beneficial. And uh, it certainly is something where we have to be very critical of how AI is being used, critical in the sense of examining it and being aware of it, but uh, AI can be and is being used for a lot of good uh, in our um, uh, uh, in our society. Okay, next one. Uh, okay, uh, displacing. This is where we start getting into, okay, this is getting interesting now uh, as far as uh, what are the implications. Displacing sole human author content production. Some people say, well, you're taking jobs like a news industry, for example, they say, well, you're taking jobs away from people. Well, those jobs are just uh, one argument against that is these jobs are disappearing anyhow. Or, you know, just like in a grocery store, people say, and again, you have to recognize the validity of these observations and say, okay, I can scan my groceries and um, that works okay, but I'm taking away a job uh, possibility for someone, granted being my own, um, a job that maybe, uh, you know, some people say, well, I want to do something else. But the thing is that there are arguments and observations such as this. Okay, media giants, political strategists, others are deploying sophisticated algorithms to attract both global and local audiences with little or no human input. Intelligent software you know, is capable of learning and reacting. It's producing content arranged from news reports to PR media releases. I'd be very interested in people here, uh, including the uh, 
uh, professors, academicians, as well as practitioners, what their um, um, experience has been and if they're using it or aware of its use. Uh, again, Edelman notes AI is creating a cognitive area, area in which machines will be able to perform tasks beyond the capabilities of people, adding that almost assuredly these impacts will be profound, including a possible human species defining moment. Look at this last human species defining a, a moment. What does it mean to be human? Well, right now I got a pretty good idea who's human and who isn't. But when you think about how this can be confounded, in some ways seem absurd, but in other ways, you know, what about relationships? Do I have a, you know, like somebody might have a name for his, you know, named his car, Fred or something, but somebody could very well have, well, you got Alexi, you got Siri, uh, uh, or Alexa, I should say, Amazon, Siri, uh, and, and so forth. And it really draws into attention our relationships with, um, in this case, um, non-human beings. And uh, it draws into, okay, what does that mean? What does that mean to us? Uh, um, well, certainly from an ethical perspective and far beyond that. Okay, next one, Tony. Um, ethical implications means we're forging relationships with inorganic or non-biological entities. Forging relationships. We're communicating with these uh, entities. Again, you might have, uh, you know, have a fondness for your car. You might even have given a name. No people have given their cars names. Uh, you might communicate with them, but the car generally won't communicate back with you in any sense that we're talking about. But these are, these um, um, entities are communicating with us. And we need to take very seriously. In fact, my argument here is for us to be, take leadership here and responsibility uh, in making sure our organizations uh, are not using AI as, in the words here, an existential threat to humanity. Caution clients to seek to frame AI as an unalloyed social good. It isn't. It can be a social good and is used that way. It also could be uh, used wrongly. I looked up an article, which I don't have here, in the, something I wrote in the 1990s about the, um, the analogy between a firearm, you know, uh, a uh, firearm is, is a tool, can be used for good or for bad, just like PR. PR can be used for good, at least from someone's perspective, and bad. But uh, these are important questions and issues, and have, we have to have it straight in our mind, and we really got to take some responsibility, my argument is, in our organizations. Questions persist whether artificial intelligence, and this is really when it gets to Stephen, Haw Stephen Hawking, you remember that, uh, his fear of this. Um, uh, will control humans or whether humans can manage machines that will be more intelligent than are they. In other words, okay, can I manage this machine that's really more, you know, uh, and I'm using intelligence here uh, somewhat uh, broadly, but this machine is smarter than I am. Is this kind of machine going to control me or am I going to control them? Uh, that's obviously more depth than I'm explaining here, but AI is creating multiple ethical dilemmas, including potentially subsuming human capabilities. And uh, one scholar said, there's already a real risk that man, being sexist here, uh, uh, will be technologized rather than the technology humanized. But as systems learn on their own, humans' role can diminish. Questions arise concerning the extent to which practitioners are working with or engaging with clients who operate AI support can sustain their work as human discourse based. And here already in the United Kingdom, and this goes back about five years ago already, although this article is uh, 2019, uh, uses AI to produce 30,000 local news stories a month. And generally these are, the uh, stories are formed from databases, government databases or so forth, identify what's newsworthy and at a particular local market, or today we might say we're suffering news desert, they are able to generate news stories and craft them in a way such as a human would which uh, to me is uh, mind boggling, but you know, it's there and it's uh, well established. The next one, Tony. Um, let's see, uh, yeah, next slide. There you go. Oh, okay. Okay, DeBellick said that in the third global, did we miss one or I don't think so, I think we're okay, yeah. Okay, DeBellick said that in the third globalization of the 21st, corporate 21st century, humankind will communicate with others throughout the world, of course, uh, technology allows this but also with, and this is what uh, really is thought provoking, artificial intelligence and non-beings. 
oftentimes unknowingly, and there's plenty of evidence, and I am not including that in this uh, presentation, we'll have to communicate, interact with, indeed even have interpersonal interactions and relationships with non-beings. And at what point, um, at least draws up questions of moral agency, uh, the idea of anthropomorphizing, uh, and, and maybe it's not even the right word because you know, you can have a relationship with something that, uh, you know, is a robot, if you will. And um, I've given you probably some, well, some examples I have, and there's certainly other ones. But the idea that we'll have to have interpersonal interactions or relationships with what we would consider non-human beings, at least. Okay, next one. I think it's the last one, Tony. Hang on a moment. There we yeah, go. Okay. But new ethics approaches are needed. And this is something and that's what uh, my colleagues and I the last couple of years are examining. And I can't say we are ready with anything uh, particularly. We can recognize a problem. I'm not sure we uh, have uh, recognized or fully um, uh, satisfactorily addressed these problems, but uh, we need new ethics approaches to complement those which communicators presently resort. We're all familiar and we all practice ethics according to our. Um, well, our PR uh, code of ethics are, uh, you know, in the BEPS uh, issues that they deal with and, uh, and our, you know, the iterations of our ethics going back several decades. I won't go through the history of it now, but this is something new. This is something we've got to get a handle on. And again, I would argue that we have in our organization's primary responsibility is to build uh, joint strategies for addressing the demands of an unstable, fluid, and challenging communicative landscape. The story I always tell my students is that um, uh, 3 a.m. in Cupertino in Silicon Valley, some brilliant computer tech um, engineer is working all night or came to work early, and he uh, creates something. He said, I can build this. 8.30 in the morning, the marketing vice president comes to work and said, I can sell this. A couple minutes later, a couple months later, um, some high school kid in Nebraska says, I want this. And it changes us in ways that really, again, uh, are not fully predictable. The idea of, I guess, TikTok now is five years old. Tony did a wonderful presentation on that, um, the icon, I guess, last year. Um, and um, But who can predict? I used to, in my class, I'd all say, okay, in, in 10 years, I don't do that anymore. I say in a couple years, because we don't know. I mean, these changes are so fundamental, so monumental, and have so many implications and consequences, many of which are just unforeseeable here. So what are these approaches? Um, transparency. And this is pretty much where I end up. My colleague, um, Katerina Setsura, my Russian colleague, and I in our book, um, um, I can't remember the name of the book, it's here, the Transparency, Public Relations, and Mass Media. We argue for transparency uh, in the news media, and that's important. In other words, you know, and things like uh, what we would identify as native advertising, uh, you know, things like that, that, that people understand this. And a way we define it for news is no hidden influences exist in the process of gathering, disseminating news and other information is presented as truth, or these influences have been, and here this is what's important, clearly identified in the end product in the media. To achieve to media transparency, any influences that have been in presence should be clearly communicated in the end product in the media. And what's important here, I think from public relations, everything that we hold dear in our own values, that there is transparency um, and an obligation of transparency uh, to people when they know how and when, what ways artificial intelligence again, has been broadly defined here, uh, is being used. And I think that this idea of transparency in this sense uh, is really fundamental. I really uh, urge uh, the PR professional community and scholarly community to just continue. They have been paying attention to this, but really to continue and do so. I believe that's my last slide. Isn't that correct, Tony? These yep. are references if you're interested. And, uh, but otherwise, I, I think the real, I'm trying to set the stage here, but I think the the, the most value is going to come here with our discussions, our Q&A with uh, Tony and then with others here. I'd also like to welcome the College of Fellows Chair, Margaret Ann Hennon. Welcome, yeah. Margaret Ann. Good to see you. <coughs> so, Dean, let me, you've given us an awful lot to, uh, to unpack here. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime there's a presentation that tells me we're in a human species defining moment, I think you've captured our attention. <laughs> um, so, 
I attended a presentation by a scholar in AI back in June. Can you get a little closer to the mic uh, there, Tony? Sure. Is this better? Yeah, that's much better. Yeah. Thank okay. You. So um, a gentleman named Martin Waxman, mm -hmm. who all, uh, most of us know, he's very active in the Canadian Public Relations Society and PRSA, and he's an adjunct professor at McMaster University. Um, he put on a presentation to a group of us at Syracuse University's Lubin House. The first thing he did was download an AI program that any of us can download. And he gave it a few key words and the program wrote a news story in five minutes. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty darn good. If it needed any editing at all, it needed only light editing. That was impactful enough. And then he downloaded another program that any of us can download that selected a human avatar that looks as human as you or I look, and that avatar broadcasts the news story in a news format. So these, I'll call them robots, <coughs> produced this piece of content that was of professional quality. And unlike the research that, that you did with Professor Tetsura, there, there was no requirement that that be identified to end users, right? So I, I think you're right to sound the, the warning on this stuff, but putting aside sort of the ethical implications for just a moment, let's talk about our jobs. So if algorithms can do that for us, what, what should PR people be focused on? I mean, frankly, companies don't need us to write press releases. That's not important, you know, it's important, but that you, we don't need to spend human capital on that. So will our jobs be different? And is there an opportunity to make them better? Just wondering your thoughts about, you know, what, what responsibilities ultimately become ours? Or is it simply, there's a whole new level of media literacy that we haven't fully understood yet, and we need to go after that? Yeah, these uh, there's uh, somebody more qualified than me could write three books on these questions. You just <laughs> there, but uh, the the thing is, they're they're of critical importance. I uh, did a uh, forward to a book, um, uh, Donald Lynn Pomper and Kitty Place and uh, Jay Weaver on um, on um, contemporary public relations. And I made the argument, or at least the, I, I presented a hypothesis that the life cycle of public relations, you know, there are life cycles and maybe we are closing a life cycle. I don't want to see that. I like what we do. But um, the, uh, uh, yeah, Martin Waxman, he is just incredible what he does. But um, but I, the, um, I'm tremendously troubled with that, that first of all, I would like as a consumer here, and I never liked the idea of news consumer, but it, it does make sense. I've adopted it. But the idea of a consumer, I'd like to know that that was formed by a machine. Uh, I would like to know that this person doesn't exist. And we've all seen these deep fakes, you know, what, um, what was the guy? Um, oh, um, the guy in Top Gun, Tom, I, don't know, I can't think of his name right now, but you know, yeah, you know, these deep fakes of this and and anything like that can be done. Katarina, oh, I. The, the image of, was it the image of Val Kilmer in Top Gun? Is that what you're referring to? Uh, yeah, but he, he is uh, the, 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 the star of the show. He's very famous. I can't think of Tom name. Cruise? Yeah, Tom Cruise. Yeah, Tom Cruise. And there was like a, a deep fake of him doing something that he wouldn't do. And that's completely, you know, it's commonplace now that that can be done. So the idea of credibility, and again, transparency and then credibility, I think is really essential. And it's just going to be so hard. But is our job obsolete? Um, I think our, our role isn't obsolete. Our skills, um, and I still, you know, I, I still want to be able to write a good, a good craft, a good new media release, even though this machine could probably do it better and could correct some of my... Uh, uh, stuff, but um, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, and I don't mean that flippantly. I, I, I yeah. this really well, difficult questions. And, it, is, uh, it is. And well, and, and it strikes me, it's even more difficult because we're the communications professionals and we're just coming to grips with this. Yeah. So for the person on the street who does simply consume media without thinking about its origins or its delivery systems, 
it's even more of a challenge. Leanne has raised an interesting question in the chat. Is there any regulatory discussion from the FTC about this? Or um, similar to paid posts must be labeled as sponsored as an example? Or are there ever, and, and we know the legislation always lags the technology, right? But is that even stirring at this point? I think it is. Um, I also remember a story, this goes back, this would be 2007, Katarina and I were flying back from Kiev actually. And, uh, uh, and I, I only speak English, I have enough trouble with that, but she, uh, so she was translating <coughs> newspaper and there was an article, a news story there, I'm sure met with much approval. It said, drinking beer is good for you. And it talked about all the health benefits of drinking beer, you know, which I you know and probably people, yeah, right on. That very end was a little small icon. And then you turn back a few pages. It was essentially what we would call today native advertising. In other words, it wasn't a news story. Uh, as like, well, you have a sponsor content or so forth. But, um, but anyhow, the um, regulatory... Europeans seem to, there's, uh, well, there's this Montreal statement, I, I don't have it readily available, but Europeans, uh, they are looking at this. I don't know if this falls under the general data protection regulation or not. I'm not aware that it is, but Europeans uh, are paying attention to it. Uh, Canadians are doing some, uh, I think Jean Valine is doing some uh, some connection to it. He did an article, uh, co-authored article on um, uh, well, we'll get into that, but there, there's some Montreal statement or so forth. But as far as uh, in the United States, these regulations, maybe not addressing particularly AI, but they're all over the map. California will have different ones and you know, other states. And uh, the short answer is, what I, as far as I'm aware, is no, they don't, uh, there's nothing like that. But I, I, I would argue that we got to start looking at this. Yeah, so, <coughs> from the other people extent. might have to be the. Uh, I didn't finish, or excuse me, uh, Tony, but I didn't sure. finish a uh, thought I had earlier to your earlier question. Is I really think we can't be, we weren't exactly ambushed, but we were asleep. You know, pick your own metaphor, asleep at the wheel or whatever. But when IT came about, and those websites and everything, okay, we're the communicators, we know how to do this. So, who was doing all, all these IT people who never had a course that we had in our lives? And then we were saying, no, we got to be involved in this. And we were, and I think increasingly that's the case, but we've got to take some ownership uh, aggressively, I would argue, um, certainly proactively take some ownership in, okay, transparency, just like with our, our web presence, uh, like you did in your, well, I won't get into your presentation last fall, but um, we've got to take some ownership of this. We can't relegate this to, to other people to deal right. with. Uh, you know, of course, the lawyers will deal with it from a legal perspective, but this is this is our our responsibility, our, our moral ethical responsibility, our, I would argue that one, be informed, and two, collectively, as a community, be aggressive in, yeah. in attempting to not regulate, at least make it transparent. I think that's a, a critically important point, Dean. I mean, it, it strikes me as you were making your remarks and describing some of your research, um, I, I wrote down in big letters in my notes, so who do we trust and what do we trust? And if we're sort of the trust keepers as public relations professionals, I think our job got a whole lot more challenging because not, not only can we spread mis and disinformation as humans, but bots can spread it to us. And oh, by the way, and this really kind of stretches my brain, bots can spread it to other bots. They educate each other and get smarter, right? Mm -hmm. And so as someone who can't program that technology, I think, wow, the trust challenge has just gotten huge. With, with that, I'd like to open it up to the floor to any questions from our professors and students in the audience. Anything you would like to ask Professor uh, Krukeberg? Well, let me first of all, thank you for these uh, very profound questions, which I didn't begin to answer adequately, but really were thought provoking and very helpful uh, to me and my thought, and I think in setting an agenda. It's good. Great. Thank you, Dean. Questions? Dr. Kinsey. Thank you, Tony. Dean, thank you very much for your uh, real thought provoking presentation. Uh, you know, and you mentioned that. Uh, there's a lot of ethical questions, ethical implications uh, with AI. And I wonder, is there one in particular that jumps out to you or one in particular that 
that keeps you up at night or, or that we, you think we should tackle right away? I would say, um, I'm speaking very generically and probably too inclusively, but I would say transparency. I, as a consumer, stakeholder, public, whatever of organizations, if I'm talking, I don't mind necessarily talking to a bot or to you know, a robot, whatever, but I want to know that. And I, so I guess that would fall under transparency. Uh, and I don't think that's an unreasonable request or demand or could not be regulated. I, I think it could be regulated uh, in ways that I think would be non I don't want to say non obtrusive. I mean, I don't think anybody would, any organization would mind saying, okay, you're going to be talking to a uh, bot, whatever, you know, whatever it is. So I, I would just say uh, the short answer in response would be transparency. Makes sense. Other questions, comments? Yes. Uh, hi, Dane. So I'm, I'm actually a junior in the house school and You'll have to repeat the question for him, Tony. Yeah, I can. I can do that. Please go ahead, and I'll repeat it. Yeah. So back in my elementary school, my uh, my first grade teacher actually saying, like in the technology is getting smarter, we people are getting dumber. And and now I just feel it's getting more and more true. And and part of the reason I choosing PR as my major is I want to do a job that human are still important. And AI obviously is always uh, is taking replacing many jobs in our world. And now it's still like you know, AI is taking my job now. Right. And I just kind of want wonder what's your point and what's the future of yeah. you know, of our industry and what should we start to like learn more skill like right including maybe like even computer science right trying to take over the really important question. So Dean, let me let me paraphrase mm -hmm. if I might. So. Yeah. Young man here is a junior at Newhouse, and uh, his parents told him when he was in elementary school that the machines are getting smarter and we're getting dumber, right, at the, at the same time. And he intentionally chose public relations because he wanted a field with human interaction and relationships. And now it sounds like that is being lost at least some degree to artificial intelligence. And so, what, I guess it's a question of what can we do about that? Is that a fair, a fair question? Or is there a way that we can still sort of lay claim to this idea of managing public relationships without losing the humanity of it? Wow, what a question. What a profound insight. It's a good one, huh? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's, uh, you, if you're going for your doctorate, that's a good dissertation topic here to study. Um, I, I think uh, I, I see this in two different ways. First of all, I, I remember in my high school, the guy we thought, okay, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He did, but he was saying like, don't worry. And I think they probably should have worried a little bit, but he said, you know, there's going to be, you know, machines that'll do this. So understand the concepts, understand the process. Don't worry that you're, you know, you know that 11 and 23 is what, 34, I guess, or so forth, because you'll have that. You know, like, yeah, right. You know, um, then I remember my first hand calculator. I was living up in uh, Twin Cities. Not everybody understands this term, but I was living up in Roseville. There's a horrible blizzard outside. And my checkbook was so messed up and I couldn't figure out that checkbook. I drove through this blizzard when they hoping that Kmart was was open. It was. I paid some outrageous like 40 bucks in 1970s dollars for this calculator. You know, and like, okay, I wouldn't be without a calculator now. Everything that I've done, uh, I wouldn't be without. Well, I, 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 to get to your point, um, I, I think that we might be the last people who really are, are concerned about and have expertise in these relationships with people. The reason I mentioned that about the evolution of technology is that I know I can't, I, I've lost my ability you know, to do it, maybe someone's age, I don't know, but, you know, like, okay, I used to know how to add in my head or subtract or divide probably better than I do now because, you know, and I don't worry about that because I got a calculator, you know, and any number of them. <clears throat> but I think, I don't know, I, 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 I uh, well, one, I hope we're wrong about, or um, not wrong, but 
I, we might be the last people who really understand these relationships. Everybody else is communicating with their machines and, uh, and understanding their machines. I'm not answering your question well, but I, I appreciate the point and it's got me kind of concerned too and pondering. But I think we may very well have the, be among the last to have the skill set uh, or knowledge set to uh, understand these human relationships. And, and we, if that's, if we're the only ones, that's something to be valued. Let's not lose that. Let's take advantage of that. Well, you know, and I guess if the pandemic is any lesson and, and hopefully now a return from the pandemic is that we still, we maybe value those interpersonal relationships even more right? Like it, we, we're relieved to meet in person. We see the value. So it doesn't seem as though that's gone away. Um, so there's opti there's reasons for optimism too, I think. I would agree. No, I would agree. I, I didn't I want to be too pessimistic here, but I, uh, I sure. take the point and it is uh, kind of, a, I mean, there's a lot of truth and wisdom and perspective in what, are you, what he's saying here. Yeah. I agree with you, Tony. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Um, there's a question about data privacy. So like the consumers are, you know, cautious about how they provide data and the information that is personal or public. How does the care professional proceed and build trust when AI kind of opens the door to risk or data privacy? Right. So a, a question from Dr. Erica Schneider on, on our faculty dean mm -hmm. is it, so it uh, she is quite rightly focused on the privacy aspects of mm -hmm. this. How do we, again, I get, and Erica, keep me honest here, make sure I'm conveying this right, that how do we get to a place of trust is if part of what we need to do to transact in this new medium is give up some of our data? And do we know how much we're giving up? Is that transparent, for example? If I'm on TikTok, and I am on TikTok, I know that's owned by ByteDance in China, mm -hmm. right? And for whatever reason, I sort of suspend my disbelief and I'm, oh, okay, I'm just gonna surf around in here and see what happens, but am I giving something up? And what do we do about that? Erica, please clarify. Okay. Um, so the, so what's, what's the data privacy implication of what's happening given the emergence of AI? Yeah, that's a, that's a really insightful question. Um, the um, yeah, my colleague Luke in Australia, he's convinced that uh, TikTok is just simply a very large Chinese uh, data gathering company. Uh, but uh, it's a little bit like uh, let me draw an analogy in, uh, over a century here. And from about 1890 to our entry into World War One. Uh, there's a spike in communication technology that had ramifications. One of them was, uh, uh, Robert Weeby talks about uh, oh, communities, geographic communities. Everybody knew one another's business and uh, people became more privatized. I'm simplifying like three hours of lecture here in one minute, but uh, <laughs> we, we became very much private individuals and the idea of sense of privacy. And you'll see that, you know, where people didn't want to, uh, you know, public transportation, and uh, you, we use public places in private ways, the miniplex theater, or, you know, whatever, stay, you know, whatever, plenty of examples. And then from a fast forward from about 1990 to where we are right now, and uh, these, what used to be a geographic community where everybody knew one another's business down the street, they all said a small local newspaper, community newspaper, the reason people read the papers to make sure the reporter got it straight because everybody already knew what was in the newspaper. They just want to make sure the newspaper got it straight. Um, but now we've lost that at a global level. And uh, that is a phenomenon where, I mean, we can't do anything about that except be a, sensitive to it. But the other thing about it is that um, people don't seem to mind. I, I'm always, you know, and part of this, you're, individual, uh, you know, just sense of privacy, but I, I'm oftentimes, and I'm hardly, you know, my, my friends are usually academicians and uh, PR practitioners, but, uh, and I, I don't mean this at all in a critical way, I mean, it's their choice, but I'm, I'm oftentimes shocked at what they put on Facebook. I mean, like some, like some medical thing that like, okay, I mean, I'm not ashamed of something, but it doesn't mean I didn't want everybody in, 
you know, throughout the world to know about my uh, appendicitis or, you know, I, I don't know, but I, that's not the best example, but the sense of privacy. And uh, I asked the students this, you know, and there really, there's a lack of sense of what we used to, uh, I would say my generation would consider to be private. Now it's like, hey, everybody knows everything. Don't worry about it. I tell my students, I, I just, I can't imagine what high school must be like now you know with the cyber bullying and the sharing and uh, all this stuff I it, it just must be really difficult I uh, I um so, so if if transparency is what you're advocating for does that mean more explicit permissions are required so people really consider you know I think it's important that's what Europe's trying to do with a general data protection GDPR, regulation yeah. but I don't know if it can be done I, yeah. I honestly, I can say we don't know who. Uh, I actually got I, I, gifted IT people here got me, but I actually they caught me at the right moment. I got caught up in a scam where they took over my uh, my desktop and I stopped it in time. But I mean, I, I would have normally known it, but I was in a hurry and like, well, these guys and these idiots, they get screwed up. I call them up, you know, you know, and, and I realized what I did, but. Um, I, I think they, I didn't, they didn't gain information, but the thing is we can't control that. We don't know who's on our, you know, uh, we don't know who's got what. Yeah. I, I, I'm not answering the question. I'm just acknowledging and underscoring what you're saying. And I, I don't think to some extent people don't care as much anymore. They just gave up. And then two, uh, what we can do about, we could be careful, but I don't think we can control it. Probably at least once a year, I get a notification of something, you know, whether it's, uh, know uh, awesome commercial you know um type of thing but our data has been breached and we'll give you a free year of credit monitoring because somebody hacked into our whatever and it's like okay why would i think that this company would be hacked into but they were and now i'm worried okay what data do they have yeah yeah oh it's huge all right well i believe we're at the top of the hour mm -hmm. so I'd like to thank everybody um, yeah. on behalf of the College of Fellows. I'd like to thank Dean Krugelberg for delivering the Gold Anvil Lecture um, and to Keith Copeland and to the Newhouse School for hosting this event. Thank yeah. you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks.